Netherlands, but also at the Center for Global Cooperation Research at the University of Duisburg-Essen in Germany, where there is a program on internet governance. So my Duisburg affiliation is maybe even more relevant than my later one for today. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, we have four papers this uh, afternoon. We have the pleasure of having the first paper delivered on site. So say, Stephanie Tewe is here uh, together with her sleeping colleagues in, the, in North America, uh, Robert Rogowski and Katharina Zomer, and you will speak on trade diplomacy impl implications of data sovereignty and data localization. So off you go. Just waiting for the presentation. Oh. Oh. Okay, one second. <laughs> Okay, looks like we have a technical issue. Pilar, would you be okay to come in a little bit earlier and we switch the order? Yes, sure, no problem. Perfect, thank you so much. So we have Pilar Rodriguez. Uh, you are speaking also uh, together with, or in the name of Jorge Emiliano Perez Martinez. You're from the Internet Governance Forum in Spain. And I have your title as East Wind, West Wind, Avoiding a New Technological Cold War. That sounds engaging. Yeah. Off you go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, I think you can see it well now. You can see it very well. OK, thank you. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, uh, we don't see it on site. Oh, you do see it? Um, okay, now I'm not, I'm not sure what I have to do. Um, hold on just a, just a second. Yeah, we're all set. Go ahead, Pilar. Okay, thank you. Um, well, so uh, my paper is called East Wind, West Wind, Avoiding a Technological Cold War. Uh, I'm Pilar, I'm chair of the Youth Internet Governance Forum in Spain. Um, and I'll be presenting today. So um, what uh, we are going to do is we're going to analyze uh, the European digital position and compare it to the United States and China, this technological giants that we're seeing. Um, because we have seen throughout the sessions of today that uh, Europe, Africa, Latin America, we're becoming the battleground of well, what Professor Wolfing said before, the used strategic battles between the United States and China. And that's what we don't want. We're seeing uh, how these two countries are engaging in this technological Cold War, uh, blocking each other, uh, trades between each other. And um, Europe should use its position to try not just to mediate, but uh, to try to become involved as one of the key players. Um, we see that it's working with both sides of the balance. Uh, we have all these data alliances with the United States. Uh, today, uh, there was a merging um, uh, <laughs> because we launched the uh, new digital partnership with uh, the Republic of Korea. So we are trying to join both sides. Uh, throughout this paper, we followed, uh, well, very traditional methodology. We did a pastel analysis to see the context in which Europe is. Uh, we did afterwards an internal analysis that uh, we're going to specify more here because we don't have a lot of time. So we're going to avoid the pastel analysis. We put it in these three key points, the technological environment. I'm an engineer, so I'm very focused on technology. Uh, the regulatory environment, where we compare the digital uh, regulations in each of the three uh, regions. And then uh, one of the key aspects that uh, we're dealing with here here in the Internet Governance Forum, which is European digital sovereignty and how it affects internet fragmentation. With all this, uh, we have specified some key digital enablers, 5G, artificial intelligence and blockchain. And then we have summoned it all into a SWOT analysis and then seen, as I said, how this affected internet fragmentation. 
So uh, let's get into detail. Um, these are the patents of the ICT related technologies. We can see here um, how Europe lags behind a lot. This is not big news um, because, well, we all know that we're trying a lot, we're investing a lot in becoming uh, digital leaders, but we're still very far away when it comes to big companies like Huawei like Google that patents a lot, but uh, it's very important to keep in mind what we're measuring here. We're measuring here digital communications, computer technologies, and things like that. Europe has very, very strong other sectors. We have one of the strongest automobile sectors. We have one of the strongest pharmaceuticals. We have one of the strongest cosmetics with uh, L'Oreal. So what we propose in our paper is that we have to base our digitalization into these sectors. So instead of trying to compete with this big, big tech, we should, like we're doing right now, regulate them so that they can't, I don't want to use the word control, but we should try to focus on these big sectors that we're very strong at. And from digitalizing those sectors, the other ones will follow them. And like we say, create this industrial digital drive that will lead to more patents and as we change this and the way that digitalization is measured, if we include this uh, fourth industrial revolution into the way that digitalization is measured, Europe will increase a lot in these indexes. Here we have, well, a rather similar graph, only this time it's with research and development. We can see, again, these big tech giants. We have Huawei, we have Alphabet, but we also have Europe industries, Europe companies in the top 10. We have Volkswagen, for instance, in the automobile sector. So we do have companies that are investing a lot in research and development. We have the European Commission investing a lot in Europe and in research and development. So it's important to focus our, on our strengths instead of trying to increase our weaknesses because our competitors will have that advantage compared to us. We need to focus on what sectors we're strong and invest in those sectors so that the other ones will follow. Um, here we can see uh, our big weakness, which is the startup ecosystem. Um, Europe is hand in hand with the US when we create startups. We, we, you have the uh, image in our paper, we, we don't wanna make this too long. So we do create a lot of startups. The problem is that these startups don't become scale-ups. They are bought by US companies before that. So what Europe should try to focus on is creating startups, again, in these sectors that we have been mentioning and trying to help them become scale-ups, help them become digital unicorns using especially these three key enablers that we're going to see um, later on, using 5G, using artificial intelligence, using others, metaverse, word that we're all uh, seeing in the news these days. We should use these digital technologies uh, helping create um, these scale-ups from these startups instead of them being bought by United States or Chinese companies. Uh, Yes, okay. Um, here is uh, the value chain for the 5G. It can be extrapolated for all the other digital enablers. So what we wanted to show with this picture is the interdependencies between the countries. So we have a huge American dominance in cloud. We have uh, Google, Amazon Web Services, we have Oracle. But if we take a slightly deeper look, we also have Alibaba in China. So. It's like we have these two blocks in cloud, <laughs> one Chinese, one American, but Europe is beginning to enter this market. We're starting to see European companies entering this market. Again, in the data centers, we have Meta, we have Google, we have Amazon Web Services, but again, Europe is starting to enter these markets. Why? Because we have very strong operators, like for instance, Deutsche Telekom that we are seeing is starting to appear in uh, all of these um key value chain components. Again, we see China uh, becoming, um, well, China has become one of the key factories in the world. They're starting to develop a little bit more uh, towards innovators, but uh, we all know that they are the main uh, chip exporters in the world. But again, Europe is trying to change this with the Chips Act. So we are developing key alliances with safe providers to try to uh, let's say, reduce our dependencies, because we have seen that when a pandemic comes, this whole um, Pilar, value Pilar, chain gets disrupted. Pilar, just, yes, just, sorry. No, just to warn you that you have a, a minute, a minute and a half left. Yes, only one, only one slide left, so don't worry. Um, 
So uh, to sum up on this uh, slide, there are very big dependencies. They are uh, starting to get broken. Uh, we have seen the United States with security concerns. They're blocking Chinese products. Uh, they're blocking their companies from uh, becoming uh, involved with China, blocking uh, the sale of artificial intelligence products to China, but we also see China blocking this. And Europe in the middle trying to, let's say, mediate and, um, let's say, creating alliances on both sides. Uh, finally, we have uh, the digital sovereignty. We all know that there are the three models, Europe with uh, regulation, the United States with companies, and China with this uh, state of protectionism. Um, we do see that the United States is trying to achieve more of, uh, let's say, regulatory sovereignty, but most of these are just um, the introduction to uh, Congress, and we all know that that doesn't really go very well. So because I'm running out of time, I'm just going to stop here. Uh, you have a lot more details on the, uh, the paper, and thank you very much. No, thank you so much, Pilar. That gave us a real good taste to get started with and a lot to discuss and debate, I think, afterwards. Uh, Stephanie, I think your slides are now... Operative, yes. So let's uh, let's go ahead and go back to uh, your session. Go ahead. Um, cool. Thank you. So uh, my name is Stephanie, and I'll be presenting. Oh, yes, that works. <laughs> my name is Stephanie, and I'll be presenting uh, on trade diplomacy implications of data sovereignty and data localization, which is a paper that I co-authored with Dr. Robert Vergowski and Katie Zomer, who couldn't be here today. Um, so some of the main questions in our paper were what are the diplomatic implications of data sovereignty? In what ways are countries shaping national data regulatory frameworks? And how are these various data regulatory or data localization regulations influencing international trade agreements? We focus specifically on the European Union, the United States of America and China. And in terms of trade agreements, we looked at the economic partnership agreement between Japan and the EU and the regional comprehensive economic partnership in Asia. Um, so over the past few years, uh, as our societies have become more and more online, uh, we're seeing increased digitalization and increased e-commerce, which is increasing the flow of cross-border data. And so we are realizing the sort of the value of all this data and so data are becoming increasingly important and with that um, there's increased calls for data sovereignty however there's as a result of these calls for data sovereignty there's um, a lot of regulations being implemented but these in some ways act as non-tariff barriers to international trade um, and since there is not a global comprehensive agreement on how to deal with issues of cross-border data flow we're seeing a regulatory vacuum, which is being filled by um, na national and regional um, trade agreements or national and re regional uh, regulations. So most notably within the European Union with the General Data Protection Regulation, which was implemented in May 2018 and has a strong focus uh, on creating a privacy framework um, creating a privacy framework and sort of enabling trust within within digital society in, in Europe. Uh, the GDPR has a strong focus on individual rights and privacy, which is in stark contrast to the Chinese initiatives, which are more focused on collective sovereignty. Uh, over the past few years, there's been a lot of regulations within China. Um, starting in 2017 with China's cybersecurity law, which focuses on data and cyber sovereignty. Um, and under this law, the CCP may seize data for national security reasons. Uh, also more recently, the data security law of September, which was implemented in September 2021, which focuses on strengthening national security related data storage. And the personal information protection law, which was implemented in November 2021, which focuses on regulating online data and protecting personal information. Um, and so within China, the Cybersecurity Administration makes a distinction between important data and core data. And depending on what kind of data it is, they can say that it's, it pertains to national security and with that sort of take ownership of the data. Um, uh, and then in the United States, it's interesting because there actually hasn't been any uh, any federal 
regulations on, on privacy and on data protection yet. And so in the absence of any federal regulations, um, a handful of states have taken state action, including most notably California with the California Consumer Privacy Act, which was implemented in June 2018 and is modeled heavily upon the GDPR. Um, over the summer, the US did start um, negotiations on a federal level to, uh, to get the American Data Privacy and Protection Act. It was previously passed within a subcommittee and is now being sent to the full house for consideration. Um, and it's interesting because whereas China focuses on national security and the EU focuses on individual rights, um, the US sort of seeks to find a balance between privacy, security, but at the same time companies and, and trade. Um, so in terms of um, in terms of how these data, how these frameworks influence uh, trade agreements, we looked at the economic partnership agreement between Japan and the EU, which was implemented in February 2019 uh, to liberalize, uh, liberalize and facilitate trade and investment. And back in 2019, the European Union decided that Japan has an adequate level of protect data protection. Uh, but actually over the summer, the European Data Supervisory Board argued that despite this adequacy decision, um, further negotiations on cross-border data flows will be, will be needed. Uh, and so this is yet to take place, these negotiations. Um, also, we looked at the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which um, is uh, one of the largest free trade agreements in, within Asia. And it's most notably without India, which is interesting. It was implemented in January 2022, and it includes broad provisions um, on cross-border data flows. And also it includes a lot of national security exceptions, which China really enjoys. Um, and it was interesting because India was involved in negotiations for this from 2011 till 2019, but in the end decided to opt out, um, and that could be because they have a long history of non-alignment or because of their sort of worriness of da data colonialism. Um, so within, so globally there's, there's a lack of any sort of global agreements on how to regulate data and how to regulate, yeah, how to regulate the cross-border flow of data. And it's also unlikely that any global agreement will will emerge because given the different interests of all different regions and different countries. And so therefore we recommend uh, setting up sort of an international structure um, that can still be a place where negotiations can take place on this. Um, and so it would be useful to have formal agreements on regulatory cooperation and this could be done through setting up a regulatory council consisting of high-level technical officials um, of the relevant regulatory agencies across nations. Um, and additionally, creating a small secretariat which um, can establish an international agency presence to ensure that formal institutional collaboration takes place and also to push an agenda and monitor and support implementation. So in the, given that there's no globally accepted data sovereignty framework, uh, nor are there any comprehensive binding multilateral agreements, um, it is likely that far-reaching national regulations will emerge. And in order to f uh, prevent fragmentation in terms of regulations, it is important to at least stay in, stay in touch and stay in negotiations um, to sort of uh, try to converge these different regulatory frameworks. Because uh, currently, with all these different national regulations that are emerging, uh, those really can act as a non-tariff barrier to international trade, which sort of stifles international trade and further growth. And so it is imperative that any sort of system that emerges is based on, sh based on shared values, respects the sovereignty of the different nations and their national regulations. Um, but yet also accommodates to the transnational nature of cross-border data flows. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please let me know.
Great. Thanks very much. That was uh, that was wonderful. Very nice to have an on-site presentation as well. Um, great. We'll move on to a, to a third paper. Uh, I think, Carla, you're going to give this one uh, on co-production for artificial intelligence project implementation, uh, lessons from Latin America. Um, so you're speaking, I think, from the UK at the University of Surrey, and your colleagues Maria Esther Cervantes and Fabrizio Scolini are at the Latin America Open mm -hmm. Data Initiative. So, Carla, go ahead. Excellent. Thank you very much and for the opportunity of being here. And yeah, as you mentioned, my name is Carla Bonin. I'm Associate Professor at Surrey Business School. Uh, and today I'm, I'm just presenting on behalf of my co-authors that, um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting project that I think happens at the layers of the application. So basically what we've done here, um, and I'm going to walk you through very briefly on the paper, is we know there is a lot of interest on uh, tapping into to artificial intelligence to solve all sorts of problems, um, especially public um, problems, right? So governments in the region, in Latin America, are definitely looking into solutions. So, but we don't know yet what works best and how to do it and, and so on. So basically what, what we want to uh, ask here as a, you know, overall is how do multiple stakeholders, uh, such as citizens, the private sector, uh, work together in designing and implementing artificial intelligence AI projects in the public sector in Latin America, right? So in the context of this research, we take uh, AI basically as machine learning tools, very much an applied uh, idea of artificial intelligence, uh, very much tap, tapping into how to analyze, cluster, automate, and eventually predict activities or outputs. And again, in the context of governments, right? So, um, how we look into this and how do multiple stakeholders collaborate? Well, we use the co production uh, framework very much from the public sector and public administration. Um, as an analytical tool to basically allow us to classify how are these projects coming together. In a nutshell, uh, what we define as co-production is as follows. It's an umbrella concept that can, captures a wide variety of activities that can occur in any phase of the public service cycle and in which state actors and lay actors, as I said, you know, sometimes NGOs, sometimes cooperatives, sometimes private sector, sometimes citizens work together to produce benefits. Um, we sort of, you know, I won't go into a lot of details, but when we say the different phases of the, the service cycle, um, we differentiate among co-commissioning, co-design, co-delivery, and co assessment right um and and you can read it from there but they have different implications in how um you know these actors come together and also for the projects we are studying it also has um consequences in in some of the findings that we 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 encounter in this empirical project so let me go uh, a bit further to explain oh, there Empathy, this is our empirical setting, right? We study seven projects uh, funded by this program called Empathy, financed, financed by the Canadian Centre. IDRC, so some of you might be familiar, and, and other bodies in the region. This were a small scale uh, collaborative projects uh, in the region. So this means that it was an AI applied project that had the public sector and uh, another actor. Um, and so we interviewed them. We had lots of, you know, project um, uh, secondary data like proposals, financial reports, uh, pitch decks, transcripts, and, and some other communities. So we had uh, what we call, you know, in qualitative research privilege access to this data. And then using that framing that I, I showed you before in the four phases of uh, the, the service cycle, and 
let me move this that is interrupted me here sorry uh we classified these seven projects that by the way then you can go and 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 look more more details but they were basically happening in different um countries in latin america and in different industries so for example dinawa or or conae were and uh, Dinawa it's in, in Uruguay, but they were appearing as a co-commissioning and a bit more far away from the public. While, you know, we only have one in co-design, one project happening in Chile um, th that was very much on, on pollution. And we found that a lot of, or the majority, again, this is a small sample, of course, but we found that the co-delivery or the so-called co-delivery was the, the most, I mean, well, we find most projects uh, with a very peculiar thing that these, these projects in the public sector and the collaboration with um, NGOs and private sector had a lot to gain. I'm going to uh, say a bit more in the findings. And we only have one on with what we classify as co-assessment. And it was also a collaborative project beyond borders. So let me just walk you very quickly on the key findings. Can I move my slide now? Oops. There. We found that while governments love to speak about AI everywhere, the data standardization and very much what we call open data or government data was essential for the success of this project. At different, you know, at the different phases. And this is key because we tend to focus a lot on the algorithms, but then the data that is feeding this, this, uh, you know, machine learning tools is still at the core and we have to focus on that still a lot. Um, the co-production initiatives had the potential to contribute to innovation at both sides because the collaborators outside government learned a lot about public problems and vice versa governments gain a lot from this expertise outside that this is a well-known thing in digital government transformation or digital government projects but we we did explore this in more detail here and the third one is that hiring external consultants especially from uh, small firms or NGOs or, or people that, are, that know how to manipulate these tools can be a short-term solution for the lack of uh, internal and, and capabilities in, in the public sector. Um, definitely last, find, last finding is that of course the co-production projects that use public data and only have a transactional relationship, one, uh, you know, endure or we're, we're are going to be less likely to become long term or permanent collaborations. Not surprising, but still something we have to pay attention. So that's what I wanted to show or share with you today. And looking forward also to the discussion. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you. We, we, we can applaud for them too, no? <laughs> Even though they're not in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Uh, now we have one other paper from uh, Jenny, uh, Ji Hyung Jenny Lee at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, up early for us, thank you. And the title is The Aftermath of Pandemic Data Disclosure Towards a Data Governance Framework for Equitable Data Cultures. Off you go, Jenny, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'll just share uh, my screen and the presentation. Oh. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny and I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Washington's Department of Communication. And in this paper, I'm going to be examining how the South Korean government's data governance shape the cultures of the pandemic and the implications they have for thinking about governance frameworks as states increasingly turn towards big data to mitigate national risks. 
So to provide you a brief background, the Korean government um, managed pandemic data in two main ways. The government authorities trace the virus by collecting people's personal information, such as their location data and demographic data, made possible through the cooperation with credit card companies and telecommunication companies, to name a few. And then they reported anonymized location data and demographic data of confirmed patients through local government's websites and um, emergency text messages, as indicated in the pictures here, to alert citizens of positive cases nearby. And the news media readily reported on these anonymized data because they're made public. And despite the high privacy risks associated with this method, the government legitimized their data disclosure um, as protecting Korean citizens' right to know about the pandemic and advancing data transparency. So, but while anonymous, this data disclosure strategy has led to grave unethical practices and concerns, such as enabling people to speculate the faces behind the anonymous data and engage in social shaming and spread the rumors online. So this may be an example of a newspaper article you may have seen in relation to the government's data disclosure strategies. So these are the types of cultures that this paper is concerned with, um, mainly the practices and imaginary shaped by the government's data disclosure. So while the study conducts a case study of South Korea, it has implications for studying how ideals of data transparency and empowerment through data becomes main ideals in executing nation's data governance strategies in face of uncertainty and risk. So in this paper, I argue that critical interventions into data governance needs to be made with a deep understanding about the cultural norms, values, and practices that are encouraged, reproduced, and legitimized through their operation. And while the Korean government no longer publishes patients' data, this study will examine how the ethical, implication, the ethical implications of their initial strategies and propose alternatives to their data governance strategies for future emergencies. So to do so, I ask the following research questions. What kind of data cultures and imaginaries are encouraged and enabled by the government's data disclosure strategies? What are their ethical implications for citizens' rights and well-being, in particular that of minoritized identities? And lastly, what kind of data governance is required to manage data disclosure in equitable ways? So to answer these questions, I conducted critical discourse analysis of multiple um, online materials such as governments, uh, public reports, briefings, uh, news media articles, coverage of the government's disclosure strategies and privacy dilemmas, and human rights organizations' critique of the government's data management. The first type of data cultures identified in this study is the data cultures of collective right to know. The health institutions responsible for the data-driven strategies, mainly the Korean Disease Control and Prevention Agency, the Ministry of Health and Welfare, presented data disclosure as a public service that espouses democratic principles, mainly information transparency. So therefore, data is presented as a public good that can empower the collective of knowledge to navigate through the heightened uncertainty of the pandemic. However, the collective right to know is heavily fixated on personal data of infected patients with their individual rights, such as their right to control their data and have their anonymity protected, becoming eclipsed by citizens' understanding of data as a public good. This has also, this is also linked to the culture of criminalization, where citizens who are seen as innately dangerous, or citizens who are seen as not abiding to government measures, seen as a threat to the data governance and the public safety. Um, the criminalization of COVID-19 patients became most prominent in May when a new cluster of cases was reported in Itaewon, a multicultural district in Seoul, South Korea. When the news reports revealed that the district um, 
that the cases were linked to uh, gay clubs in South Korea, the public engaged in public shaming and homophobic surveillance across the network media landscape. And this was made more um, severe as news media posted detailed travel histories of the visitors of the club. Um, criminalization of COVID-19 patients also occurred for migrant workers who weren't able to, uh, when it was reported that they, they left the quarantine area because they couldn't afford time away from their jobs. So these examples illustrate how criminalization occur alongside existing social norms, uh, producing data power relations. The ownership of data and the right to access data of others reside with the majority, while society's minoritized members receive heightened surveillance and barriers to benefit from data as public service. Lastly, the culture of criminalization also leads to the culture of speculation rather than certainty. So data is provided by the government to provide us with confidence um, to manage the pandemic, but ironically, it has led to more speculation, and this occurred online mainly across these network media landscape where YouTube personalities and users engage in speculating these criminalized identities and speculating who they could be and also speculate about what their personal lives would be like. And so data disclosure strategies, mainly the lack of policy surrounding how data is published in these networks landscape further drove this economy of speculations. So in the paper, I talk about the policy recommendations specifically in relation to uh, the, uh, South Korea. But in this presentation, I'm going to focus more on the implications this might have for area for scholarship and critical data studies and data governance. So big data will be increasingly incorporated into state responses to national and security risks such as the global pandemic. And states also seek to make these data public um, in the name of data transparency. However, the study reveals that data do not speak for themselves and are governed by society's norms and the changing media landscape. With that said, at the stage of implementing and creating data governance strategies, strategies there should be considerations for the following. Um, oops, sorry, I think I, I'm going over time a bit, but there should be considerations for data, what kind of imaginaries are created through the data governance strategies, mainly the, the imaginaries of the public, because that is how we make sense of what is going around in the world and how we make sense of others. Also, the idea of public data needs to be critically interrogated to check whether it is creating new data power relations. Who can claim to be part of the public? Who is the public? And third, when we talk about sharing and public, uh, publicizing these data, we need to think about these network media landscape and how people are using these data in, in line with social media cultures such as call out and shaming. Um, thank you for listening to my presentation and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was great. Um, super. Now we have a uh, discussant, Dimitri Epstein from uh, Hebrew University, uh, Jerusalem. And super thanks to Dimitri, to Dima, because he has jumped in at the last minute. Uh, in the, with his usual sense of public service as uh, chair of the GigaNet community. So, Dima, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, those thought-provoking presentations. Um, yes, um, I was called to duty, more or less, this morning. So, uh, I'm one of those um, discussants who is probably projecting more kind of, of his own work on what he just presented rather than kind of reflecting reflecting in depth what you have written in the papers because I only was able to skim them uh, today. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to offer a kind of a general reflection that is kind of me projecting kind of my own work on what I just heard and what I, I glanced at in the morning and and then have some kind of more pointed questions slash comments to each one of the presenters. So my kind of meta observation, I'll start with this, is um, it's really, really interesting to see an entire panel dedicated to the regulation of data flows 
at the GigaNet Symposium, right? It kind of makes one think about uh, the kind of the scope and the boundaries of our field and um, kind of the, the journey that we as a community made from kind of focusing explicitly and perhaps solely on a kind of critical inter regulation of critical internet or governance of critical internet resources, right, to these broader questions of governance of information flows. Um, and not sure yet what to do with the thought, but wanted to put it out there for, you know, for us perhaps engage with it uh, later. Uh, now, moving on uh, to the papers, I think it was really interesting how, um, in many ways, complementary the four presentations were, uh, whereas the first two papers kind of dealt with uh, kind of big thoughts and sort of broad uh, observations about um, what is being done or what can be done in the area of data flows regulation. Uh, the... The, the two papers, the, the second kind of portion, the other two papers, right, kind of dealt with a more concrete, a kind of more, more bounded, right, experiences of uh, data flows governance in practice. Um, so, uh, and, and I think in a way, uh, the papers raise questions a little bit, uh, want, uh, like one to another. So, um, I will go in the order in which the papers were presented, uh, sorry, in which papers appear in the program and, uh, um, and I'll hopefully will make sense out of it. Uh, so starting with uh, the trade diplomacy implications of data sovereignty paper, um, uh, I think it's kind of uh, an ambitious uh, kind of uh, undertaking with some very acute observations about the regulatory vacuum that is being um, filled with, uh, you know, kind of regional initiatives, uh, which, but then uh, kind of the concluding remarks are calling for a sort of a centralized node, right, that could coordinate or promote harmonization of this regional and local uh, initiatives. And I wonder um, whether given, right, uh, we're in year 16 of the IGF, right, so we have you know, a couple of decades of debating internet governance in general and attempts to kind of resolve some of these burning questions. So I wonder whether, to what extent this call is, uh, kind of, to what extent does it take into account what we have learned in the past two decades, whether it's feasible to have a global regulatory body such as the one you proposed in the paper. Um, is it um, kind of, how does this kind of call towards convergence around the singular framework, right? To what extent does it take into account what we learned uh, again in the past couple of decades uh, from the attempts of um, trying to converge around various internet uh, policy issues, right? And I would say perhaps like unsuccessful uh, attempts to converge around those, especially in international bodies. And I wonder what about other models of governance to be considered in this case? For example, polycentric models, right? Where there's not necessarily kind of a single, uh, again, node in the network uh, where everything converges, right? But there is a distributed form of governance that kind of takes to talks to some of these ideas we've been hearing about today and about multi-stakeholderism, et cetera. Um, Moving on to kind of the avoidance uh, of a, a new technological Cold War, which I think is a great uh, title. Um, and again, like I take my, again, my all my comments with this kind of caveat of uh, how bounded they are and a kind of this the genuine questions and kind of they're not meant to be like really criticism. But I kind of, this paper made me think uh, uh, about um, I'm just getting to my notes, right? Whether this kind of call for Europe to take um, kind of a leading role on the one hand, a little bit kind of past its time, Europe is taking a, a leading role through the same, you know, kind of regional agreements that we just heard about 
in the in the other paper, right? Like if you think about GDPR as a kind of an example of you know regional policy that has a global ripple effect, uh, I think this is an amazing example that kind of um, I mean in a way places your paper kind of behind the development that's already happened. But on the other hand, I wonder whether it's a little bit of a paternalistic kind of take on, you know, on the role of Europe in resolving kind of this big brother entering, you know, squaddle between, uh, you know, siblings and trying to kind of prevent them from uh, destroying each other. So uh, borrowing completely from it, like in a different place, like in science communication, uh, there was this deficit model that was uh, kind of uh, practiced in, for many years, where the idea is that, you know, there is there are scientists who kind of kind of know what they're talking about and in this position of privilege, and there are citizens who don't know what they're talking about, and there is a knowledge deficit that the scientists need to fill. And over years, right, we kind of learned to kind of realize that uh, 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 it's not that black and white, right? It's not that kind of simple. So, uh, and there is you know this whole citizen science movement, etc. So there is a lot of kind of you know processes that are mutually feeding, uh, right, and are trying to deal with like genuine differences and experiences and practices and power structures, right, in this kind of two groups. And it's, I was uh, kind of skimming through the paper, especially when I was listening to your presentation, it kind of, I had, had the same sense, right? So there is this kind of neutral, powerful figure in the form of the European Union, right, that kind of knows something that others uh, do not, right, and that what gives this kind of body, this kind of responsibility, not just like the ability, but responsibility to step in and resolve the tension. And I wonder, um, again, like, how does this bud with, uh, uh, with the realities of um, how these policies develop? Um, and particularly, for example, this whole point about transactional nature of many of those relationships that Carla was uh, kind of uh, mentioning in her at the end of her presentation. So uh, moving to um, Carla's presentation uh, on co-production of uh, artificial intelligence um, and project implementation, I think it uh, kind of gets 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 at a very interesting kind of intersection, uh, which we all already heard about this morning, right? This whole idea of uh, sometimes abstract uh, ideas about policy with more practical attempts to translate them into something tangible and actionable and concrete. And I personally find this uh, fascinating. I would love um, to hear um, a little bit more about how you selected your texts Right, so I understand the point about privileged access, but how did you decide what to include and what to exclude uh, you know, in your analysis? And I think one of the interesting points, which again, like I think raises questions uh, towards you know, the previous two presentations is that the technical expertise lies outside of the government, right? So, and it again kind of goes back to my question about, um, like to what extent do the first two papers take into account what we've already learned in the past two decades of thinking about internet and information governance questions about the fact that uh, the technical expertise lies outside of the purview of the government. And for Carla, I was wondering uh, whether she has any thoughts about resolving the kind of the transactional nature of most of these relationships in which uh, and regulatory bodies and, you know, technology companies or society organizations or citizens, right, um, engaged in, right? So I understand the point that you're making and the kind of problem that you raised, but I wonder if you have any thoughts about how do we actually entangle it? Because I would guess, I do not know, that majority of interactions are based on this kind of transactional uh, notion. And finally, to Jenny's paper about um, um, cultures of uh, um, data governance during pandemics, this kind of the pandemic inheritance of the governance inheritance of the pandemic, if we, if we may say, right? It was an interesting moment indeed in time, which kind of exposed a lot of uh, 
a, a lot of our kind of taken for granted uh, ways of thinking about data and data policy. And I think this is a very interesting uh, project. I, again, kind of have a, a very, in a way, it kind of speaks to some of the work that I've been involved in around privacy and the pandemic. That's why kind of it was kind of easy for me to relate. Um, here again, I have a kind of a methodological question about uh, your kind of inclusion criteria for documents for the critical discourse analysis, because it seems like a very vast corpus uh, to work with. Um, and um, I really appreciate how um, kind of I took a note as you were speaking, but then it kind of wrapped it up in your discussion. Um, the point about power, right, about how these cultures eventually uh, reflect power structures within uh, a differ, like a given nation state, right, in, in your case, uh, South Korea. Um, also, I like how you brought in this idea of imaginaries as a critical kind of component in us kind of thinking about policy. And um, I wonder again, kind of in this, uh, in the link that you're trying to make between your kind of observations for the study of uh, information governance, <laughs> uh, data governance, and uh, kind of the policy recommendations, right? So, like, how do you think we can practically either kind of better understand the clash of imaginaries in the work of policy elites or kind of bringing it more to the IGF? Like, how do we actually put it in practice? How do we help, um, you know, policymakers imagine more diverse uh, audiences for the tools that they create? And I'll stop here. Thank you very much again. Great. Thank you so much, Dima. I think he does deserve a hand for that. <laughs> Uh, I don't know about you, but if I'm if I'm given four papers to discuss at two hours' notice, I wouldn't be able to put put together a commentary like that. So, uh, thank you very much, Dima. That was that was super. Um, rather than go to the uh, uh, paper givers right away, I think let's take a window for the audience to uh, ask any questions, and then we'll let the uh, authors respond in one round to all of the feedback that they've got. Um, people in the audience here want to ask any any questions, any comments on any of the papers. Yes, please. And uh, maybe identify yourself so that the people know who they're, uh, who they're hearing from. Thank you. Thank you. Brahan, my name is. Okay. Just uh, I have observed that uh, IT governance and the data governance and the policy. There are three things uh, he mentioned. But what uh, the IT governance and the data governance differ from the uh, security issues? There are data disclosures between them. So uh, how the researchers uh, see in different ways. OK, good. So the, the, the connections between data governance and security issues. Yeah. OK, yeah. And, how, and how you see that in relation to your separate, uh, your various subjects. Thank you. That's a nice connecting question. Others here? It's your moment for a global stage, please. Yes, sir. Good, uh, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Robert. I just wanted to, oh, ah, okay. I just wanted to ask if there are any lessons uh, to learn across uh, from what you have done. What are the good practices in uh, intergovernment uh, regulation, perhaps uh, formulation? We are in Ethiopia, which uh, headquarters African Union and a number of uh, organizations. Uh, the region has East Africa Commission, and uh, we have SADAC and ECOWAS, so what uh, best practices could the government uh, borrow, uh, particularly in bringing together industry, uh, probably academia, and then the government things? Great, thank you. Again, a nice question connecting papers. Yes, please, in the back. Thank you, Mr. Lassau. Mm -hmm. I want to ask, okay. Uh, the researcher raised uh, like uh, data colonization, but she didn't put out the how we can avoid this data colonization. So I want to ask her, 
how, uh, how we can avoid this data colonization? My question is the simple and simple. Great, thanks very much. Which paper were you t speaking to specifically? Uh, I forgot. Okay, whoever talked about data colonization, you have a question. How can we avoid it? Please, and we have in the front here, uh, Yikchen. Or actually, just take, take my mic here. Hi everyone, my name is Liz Orembo, uh, research fellow, research ICT Africa, and also a trustee at Kiktanet. Um, I don't know which paper this was, but uh, it talked about diplomacy, and uh, I think it was yours, yes. Um, so you, s you mentioned that uh, uh, there's no globally accepted data sovereignty framework, uh, nor a comprehensive binding agreement. Um, but from th from the from the corporations that uh, exist between countries, are there patterns uh, that w where we could tell trends of the common types of agreement of how a global data framework would lo would look like? Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Kweku. I'm from Ghana, and I'm just going to follow up a um, bit on the data, and also the aspect about the governance uh, of the data. So in Africa here, there's what we call the Malibu Convention for data. And um, one of the biggest problems we have is that the countries, after having that framework, having signed up, we know the global, um, the global standard now is the GDPR from the EU. And we here in Africa are more like we are caught in between what is happening. And so um, a follow-up from, from here, um, what are we doing as institutions? Why are we not talking to each other? And one of the other problems too I, I want to raise up is about the diplomacy. Um, we are in the world now where technology is being governed by different institutions. So just last month, we just came from ITU, um, and we are here at the IGF how are we as academics being able to write about how we are synchronizing this and also raising points on which we can agree on so that we are not speaking about it 10 years from now, but we've made progress about it. All right, thank you. Great, thanks. Any other? Otherwise, I'm going to do stereo. Question? From starting the morning season, from starting from the morning season, uh, we are talking about uh, data and security issues. As a government, uh, Ethiopia and Af Africa Union, especially the UN, what is the government committed and the resources address for the solution? We are uh, uh, we are uh, see the symptoms, but what are the future? solutions and the policies that formulated as national level. Any other? Technologically useless chair. Um, <coughs> Okay, very good. Just a, a, a couple, couple of little uh, abuse of the chair's position for uh, uh, people. I did I, on the uh, pillar. I also wondered about whether Europe is always the solution, and whether Europe might also work with other parts uh, in terms of forming that third leg. For Stephanie, I thought there's a little bit of an assumption that cross-border trade is always good, and uh, I wondered if you had si situations where data sovereignty issues and the like might actually say, we don't want open cross-border trade in data, but that's just a provocation. Um, for Carla, I was wondering whether this co-production actually is a way of getting increased autonomy for AI development in Latin America. And Jenny, I was wondering about the dilemma that you posed between data as a public good on the one hand and the privacy 
issues of control of one's own data on the other hand? Are there general philosophical principles that one can apply to working out the balance between those two? Or is it going to be context specific by country, by issue, and so on? Do you have an, uh, any thoughts on that? Not that anyone has to answer all of the questions that you've been put to. Um, we have how much time? 15 minutes. Okay, so 15 minutes. So that I make that two or three minutes per paper. Okay, so we just take it in the same order as they were presented. So we start with Pilar. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the question that you posed is actually quite difficult. Um, I don't think that Europe is always a solution. It's a solution to some problems. Like, uh, it can act as mediator uh, between the Western Front and the Eastern Front because we're basically right in the middle, geographically speaking. <laughs> but uh, there are pro other problems that Europe can control. Like, for instance, um, when we think about... Uh, I'm just I'm just remembering something that I heard on the USA IGF. So uh, China is moving a lot towards uh, connecting uh, South America, connecting Africa, and Europe doesn't have that capability to contrast that. But um, it can work, create alliances with the United States. It can create alliances with Japan. It can create alliances alliances with African countries, so that we can. Uh, stop having this uh, huge dependency on w just one, um, how do you say it, on just one part of the value chain. So Europe is a solution to some problems, but it's not the ultimate solution. <laughs> ah, if only we had ultimate solutions. Thank you. Um, <coughs> okay, Stephanie, do you want to take the trade question? Yes, uh, thank, thank you for all the questions. Um, I <laughs> will stand right here. Uh, thanks for all the questions. I, in two, three minutes, I will try to answer as many as, as possible, but might not be able to all of it. Um, so one of the questions that was asked about concerning data colonialism and also uh, sort of this assumption that a cross-border flow of data is always beneficial. Um, we do go in depth a little more in the paper, but we didn't really have time in this presentation to talk about it more. Uh, but I think the... What India is doing is sort of the Indian government, what they are doing in, in terms of um, providing, uh, like uh, pushing back against this, this automatic cross-border flow of data, um, I think definitely shows that, that it's not always beneficial. However, I think it's also show, it also shows that it's very hard to push back when you're so dependent upon a few big tech companies that are either American or Chinese, um, and when you don't really have an alterna a local alternative, which is even sometimes the case for, for the EU. And so it's sort of like trying to find this balance between still being able to access online services and use online uh, platforms like provided by Alphabet, Meta, those, um, while at the same time keeping ownership of your own data and making sure that big tech is not the only one profiting off of these big data, but instead it's also the Indian people. And I think the, in the government of India is, is trying, but it's, it shows that it's very hard. And I don't think there's one solution to solving data colonialism. Um, and then let's see what else. Um, I think it's, it is definitely unlikely that there's going to be one sort of global framework. Um, but I do think that just in terms of having to comply with all different data regulations, whether it's the EU GDPR, which has been quite norm setting, but also uh, South Korea's uh, data regulations or China's data regulations, just having to comply with all of that in different ways, uh, I think shows that it would be beneficial if there were to be more convergence of these um, these data regulations. And um, to go back to a question that was asked in the beginning, um, in terms of what we've learned of, of two decades of internet governance, I think it shows that a place like the IGF, even though there's no decisions being made right here, it still is important. It's an important place to at least come together and stay 
in discussion to ensure that there is there might actually be some convergence, whether it's on data regulation or any other topic. I will stop for now. Thank you. Super, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Carla, do you want to take it from here? Yeah, just very briefly, and, and thanks a lot for the comments, Dimitri, and all of you, because I'm learning a lot, which is great. Uh, very quickly, to clarify on the data, we had the full sample. I mean, these seven projects were uh, all the projects awarded, uh, 70 out of 70 that were, um, you know, contested. So, of course, it's a self-selected, and I had biases, but it was a good, you know, proxy to analyze them. And on your question on, on I think that was very, very relevant, um, on, let me just go back here, that how to resolve that transactional nature. What I think that this very small in scale and pilot shows that we need better policies to work together with you know, smaller companies and not the big techs that were, you know, it's also good to work with them in certain conditions, but we know this from digital government as well. So for example, directives of the Italian government that you must pay SMEs within 30 days also enables more of this participation. So I think we need to encourage much more of this, um, you know, policies by design, like, co-creation um, or, or co-collaboration uh, on these projects, um, you know, from policy directives. And Latin America has some very good, you know, examples very much from a long-standing work on open data that, uh, you know, been, been really a great space of collaboration. And I think that's what I got, uh, definitely very challenging to move from that transactional, but, but, but I think these pockets of projects show that, you know, both teams learn a lot and there is a lot to gain. I think those were the, the two questions that I pick as, as more important. Okay, good. Thank you, Carla and, and Jenny. <laughs> Yeah, thank you everyone for the comments, feedback, and questions. Um, the last question about the dilemma between data as public good and individuals' rights, I think, needs to be approached from a very context-specific um, approach. But then at the same time, there's scholarships such as in critical data studies, the critical scholarships and communication studies that trouble the idea of data being objective and data being good. And so scholars in this area question when we say that data is for the public, it, that data empowers the public, who is the public? Who are we actually helping? And so scholars in critical data studies are saying that we need to approach the majority as composed of the minorities. And so they introduced this idea of ethics of care. So we should bring in the ethics of care to uh, creating these data strategies and data governance frameworks so that we are very attentive to the different ways in which these ideals of data transparency, data as good impacts people disproportionately. So I think frameworks from critical data studies and feminist ethics of care can help us kind of move uh, move arguments beyond you know, the binary understanding and the arguments that often make it difficult for us to move beyond the ideas of um, public good and individual good. And so how we can be attentive to individual needs while moving forward to this equitable direction that we all desire. And I think that also kind of relates to the question on how do we make these data imaginaries? How do we cultivate equitable data imaginaries in practice? And I think it's a very difficult question. And it's something that I've been trying to think a lot in terms of policy. And what I've seen already happening is how the Korean government um, is engaging with like the news media and how they should publicize data when it comes to um, health emergencies like this so that they don't um, encourage people to draw upon like hate discourses that is readily available to them. So there is this part where they have to work with media companies um, to kind of tackle that network environment and so that they don't give resonance to these uh, data interpretations that's really deeply embedded in society. 
And I think this is a very, there's a lot of heavy lifting going on because data imaginaries is deeply rooted in our culture, right? How we view people, the norms and cultures that's been here for all all this long time. So there needs to be an approach um, in the educational sector, but also in the government itself when they're creating these uh, data strategies, they really need to think about what kind of relationships are we enabling when we create, when we um, implement this, what kind of ways of engaging, engagement are we enabling? Um, and so, yeah, I think those were the all two questions. And um, regarding the methods, how I collected the data, the data from the government resources mainly came from my previous research uh, that looked at how the government was discursively constructing the uh, surveillance technologies as democratic. And uh, the three main government bodies that I drew upon were the three main bodies that were given authority by the government to carry out these data-driven um, activities. And for the news media documents, I collected data from the period of January, uh, January 1st, 2020 to July, because that was the period when the public was most concerned about the privacy implications of the government's tracking infrastructure. And the other documents, such as the Human Rights uh, Commission and Progressive Networks, those were the most vehement opponents of how the government was disclosing strategies. And their, their critique have actually changed the government to make their uh, disclosure more sensitive. And so I draw upon those uh, oppo- literature to see counter discourses, uh, counter discourses to the government's tracking infrastructure. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, thank you, uh, Jenny and Pilar and Stephanie and Carla for responding to all of those points so succinctly and carefully. Uh, Thank you actually for the whole session, all your papers, uh, everything done here. Very good session, I think. Diverse but also complementary papers. And uh, I was really struck by how much feedback and comments as well. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's super done. Um, if you're interested in these data governance, digital data governance issues uh, more, I can shamelessly promote a session tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in caucus room 6. Uh, we, uh, I and others uh, wrote a book on these digital governance issues. Uh, Dima also has written a chapter in there and will present that book between 9 and 10 tomorrow morning in CR6. See, it's nice to be <laughs> chair. You get to promote yourself a little bit. Thanks. Today. Uh, that's my punishment. Um, okay, so again, thanks everyone for, for being here. Uh, I want to thank also Yik Chen Chin for being coordinating everything here on site. That, that's wonderful. And Roxana Radu for organizing the whole and overseeing the whole the GigaNet uh, academic uh, symposium. I think it brings us to the end of the academic symposium for this year. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And then Jen's saying, stay for the business meeting. So, uh, uh, yes, I, I encourage you to stay for the business meeting uh, shortly uh, to talk about GigaNet as a general community and how it develops. And I think your feedback would really be appreciated for that as well. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks again, everyone online. And uh, we finish this session. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you John, very much for your very charming and discussion and also very charming chair and the discussion as well. Thank you very much. Uh, so as I said, we have a business meeting uh, straight after the panel because we want to, uh, you to join us. If you are not a member of the GigaNet yet, we welcome you to join our GigaNet as a member because this is the GigaNet is the global uh, society for the uh, internet governance research academics. You know, go, we have been here f- for, for every IGF since it began in, you know, uh, 16 years ago. So it was set up by uh, uh, generations of uh, IG uh, academics and researchers. So we have, uh, we have been here for every single IGF. Okay, so, uh, so we will have the business meeting and the business meeting uh, is chaired by the current chair of the IGF, uh, sorry, the Giga, GigaNet, uh, Dimitri. So should I pass the time to Dimitri? And uh, so he will uh, lead us for the discussion, okay? Dimitri, are you ready? Always ready. Great. Um, so um, I cannot see the room. I cannot see myself double in, uh, in the Zoom window. Oh, perfect. 
Um, okay. So we will not take a break. We'll just continue straight into uh, the business meeting. And um, I mean, I have like a single agenda slide if you want to see it, or I can just uh, walk through the five points that I have on the agenda. Um, so uh, let me see if I can even do it. I can apparently do that. Uh, okay. So here is something to focus on. Okay, uh, basically this is what we have uh, in terms of the agenda for the next, uh, we have about half an hour, I think. No, or oh, 40 minutes, sorry. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in terms of what we want to discuss, and I think we have most of the steering committee either in the room or online. So feel free to jump in and uh, correct me or add. So I would like to start by, uh, first of all, thanking, um, thanking all of you who made it uh, to the room in person, uh, all of you who connected remotely and participated, listened and asked questions and participated remotely. Um, thank you to all the presenters who, uh, some of whom I understand, woke up in uh, very early hours of the day to be here with us uh, and for sharing your thoughts and kind of putting your work out there for a discussion. Uh, I hope uh, it was worth it. Um, I'd like to thank the program committee for taking the time to review uh, you know, the papers and provide feedback to the authors. Uh, huge thanks to Roxana for uh, coordinating this process so gracefully and confidently. It, you make it seem so easy, whereas uh, I think anyone who has been involved in this process knows um, that um, it's a very complicated endeavor. So I'm not in the room, but I would like to invite everybody to give a round of applause to Roxana for uh, driving the symposium program. I'll assume that I'm hearing you clapping. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I would also like to extend one last uh, round of thanks to the members of the steering committee. Again, I think most or all of us are present in one uh, form or another um, a, at the symposium. Uh, for those of you who are attending our symposium for the first time, GigaNet is a global internet governance academic network. Um, we, um, as Zig Chen mentioned, uh, the network was established uh, more or less at the same time as uh, the IGF started, and we have this sort of historical connection to the IGF. Our events have always uh, taken place on day zero of the Internet Governance Forum. Uh, we are uh, an open network with, uh, with a focus, right, on people who are active in Internet governance uh, research um, and kind of moving into kind of updates uh, uh, bullet already. Um, for those of you who are interested, uh, you're always welcome to apply to become a member. We have a membership committee that reviews the applications. Um, so people who are actively engaged in internet governance research can become full members of GigaNet. There is a form that you can uh, fill out on our website. And uh, for people who are less uh, active in the research or less interested in the research part, but still kind of want to stay up to date with us, uh, there is also an observer option. You can become an observer at GigaNet. The main difference between the two is in bullet number three, uh, as a member of GigaNet, you can uh, stand for elected positions in the network, uh, but as uh, an observer, you cannot. So a few updates about um, where we are with GigaNet at the moment. We currently have 323 members uh, spanning the entire globe and 61 observers. We have a steady flow of applications. Um, there is often a question uh, from graduate students about uh, whether they meet the membership criteria. Um, Again, uh, the main yardstick is whether you're engaged in active uh, research activities in the area 
uh, of internet governance. And uh, sometimes we may ask for a recommendation from a GigaNet member, uh, but don't be intimidated by uh, what you see on the website. If you feel that you belong uh, to the community, you want to be part of the community, you are welcome to reach out and, um, and talk to us. Uh, in the last uh, few years, and I think especially in the last year, uh, uh, there were quite a number of different events that the members of the community organized. And this is maybe a good place to emphasize that we are a membership driven organization. So anything that like everything is, everything you see us doing is done voluntarily. And everything you see us doing is an initiative coming from the members. Uh, so this year we had in January a workshop on uh, standard setting methods uh, organized by Karin Kath, Neil Stenover, uh, Ricardo Nani, and Farzane Badi. Uh, it was virtual, like one thing, one good outcome of Corona that we kind of opened up to having virtual gatherings. Um, so we had that workshop in January about uh, methods of studying standard setting processes and organizations in April, um, sort of responding to the developments uh, in Ukraine, we held a workshop organized by Courtney Reg uh, on sanctions and the well, weather sanctions around internet uh, access. You may recall there were a lot of calls uh, to, um, to sanction uh, Russian internet access. So we had a very interesting conversation around that. And uh, just earlier this month, Neil Stenover again organized another, or co-organized another uh, workshop or discussion, a virtual panel uh, about politics of disconnection, which I think still kind of uh, converses. I missed that one, but it seems to me that it conversed very well with the workshop that we had in April. Uh, at the IGF itself, we have at least 13 workshops co-organized by or organized by GigaNet members. And I have a sense that there are more. There's a much broader involvement of our community. But uh, just to kind of to show you um, the volume of activity that is going on uh, at the network. Uh, as you might have heard, uh, this is going to be the third year that we are collaborating with uh, Telecommunications Policy Journal uh, on a special issue based on the symposium presentations. And again, Oksana makes it seem so easy to navigate that process as well. And I sincerely hope that this partnership will continue um, moving on. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm getting to the third point and then we will open it uh, to a discussion in the room. Um, so those of you who are on the GigaNet mailing list, uh, you know that we have election coming on. Um, the way GigaNet is governed is that we have a steering committee consisting of uh, four people uh, who are elected by the members of GigaNet. And every year, four of these uh, roles are up for re-election. So this year, uh, the open positions are chair, secretary, the chair of the membership committee, which I mentioned before, and the um, chair of the program committee. Uh, we had some nominations for the chair position and the secretary position. We still did not have uh, nominations for membership committee and the program committee chairs. Um, I would like to use this opportunity to encourage you to, you know, to volunteer, stand up, and um, take part in shaping uh, where our community is headed. Again, this is a community of volunteers, enthusiasts of internet governance research, and uh, everything we do is kind of driven by the members and the steering committee. And uh, this is a really tangible uh, way to kind of get engaged with the field. So with that, I would like uh, to open the floor. Maybe I'll stop the slide sharing. Uh, I'd like to open the floor and uh, invite you um, to ask questions, raise issues, and uh, reflect on the symposium, 
and have a conversation to the extent we can remotely. And Nick Chen, if you can help yeah. uh, so, kind of managing the situation in the room, yeah. Yeah, so uh, any, any, because uh, many of the colleagues actually have other meetings, so some of them left, so I already passed our GigaLess information and website and the membership link to them. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, for those who are uh, still here, do you have anything you want to ask, but Dimitri or? Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I just want to, as an academic, I wanted to know more about your work and what kind of collaborations you do, if you can expand on that. My name is Mesembet, by the way, so I teach here in Addis Ababa University, so it would be very interesting to, to learn more on that. Thank you. So, a more practical question again. Yeah, I think, Dimitri, if, if you can also, you know, talk about what kind of uh, collaboration GigaLab -like can offer to other institutions, and uh, of course, I can I can talk about this, but you also can you know mention to the, our outside the audience and the delegations, and also you can show if you can yeah show them uh, yeah those uh, strategies as well. Thank you, Dimitri. Sure. Um, so um, I think a couple of things. And maybe one of the things that I did not mention in. Um, and my kind of review of updates about GigaNet is uh, that we're increasingly engaged in uh, connect, trying at least to connect academic expertise with uh, the actual you know policy discussions uh, to bring the academic expertise to the um, um, to the spaces where policy deliberation occurs. Um, and Ik Chen may add uh, on that uh, in a few minutes, or anybody else. Um, in terms of collaborations, again, like uh, GigaNet is a platform, right? Which we, uh, which is a member, right? You can use either, you know, to consult others, to find people to uh, cooperate on, you know, cooperate with on a research project. I mean, we do as a, as a kind of as a network, we do not issue kind of GigaNet branded research, right? In a sense that we do not fund research or do not um, kind of host researchers. Um, but uh, anything you can imagine uh, to kind of derive um, transactionally, right, from a network of like-minded academics and experts in the field, I mean, you can probably find it in, the, um, in GigaNet. Beyond the transactional nature, a, of interaction, a, I think again it's a community where you kind of get to know people and colleagues, and I think these collaborations kind of emerge either out of uh, interactions in workshops or uh, at the symposium, uh, etc. We did kickstart a few processes in the past, I think, year uh, year and a half trying to think more systematically about uh, how we can bring additional value to our membership. Uh, we have an uh, outreach committee and outreach chair. Uh, Ik Chen is the uh, chair of uh, the outreach committee uh, where we are kind of continuously thinking about how we can bring more value, whether it being uh, in kind of capacity building events like the methods workshop that we had uh, earlier in the year, or we've been discussing the possibility of having a, a doctoral consortium uh, or uh, kind of um, helping people secure funding in terms of, you know, kind of figuring out whether we can collaborate with external bodies to um, help people secure funding for the, for kind of, um, GigaNet sort of facilitated research. We're not there yet. It's still kind of a very, very preliminary uh, stages, but and I don't want to kind of place too many kind of promises or commitments on whoever will take over the chair role, uh, because this is my second and last um, a term as a GigaNet chair. But uh, I will just emphasize again that everything that happens uh, within GigaNet starts with the members. So if there is something that you kind of want to happen, it's just a matter of getting kind of engaged and um, 
trying to make this happen through the network. Uh, others, uh, please feel free to you know, chime in. Big Chan, Niels, um, I don't see, I'm not sure Nadia is here also uh, in the call. Uh, just like Niels, did you want to chime in on this last point? If yes, so please go ahead. And if not, we'll go to the question in the room. Okay, okay we'll go to the question in the room. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Claire. I'm a research student from uh, Sciences Po Paris. And so it's my first day at the IDF. And uh, so my research topic is about the implication of the private sector within the IDF. And I'm actually very pleased uh, because I didn't know Giganet and uh, it appears very uh, interesting to my projects. So I wanted to know, for example, if people like me, like I'm not a researcher, like I'm not a confirmed researcher, I'm just a researcher student, if I can be involved in, um, in the network and uh, if my, like, I don't know, if I can get some tips from your committee for my master thesis. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you. So I think that this, the short answer is yes. Uh, again, as I said, we have kind of two tiered membership uh, system. I mean, membership is free, but uh, so you can be either a full member or an observer. I mean, uh, I'm sure that if, you know, if I recall correctly, the kind of the procedure, and you can easily become an observer right now. Uh, again, I think probably you can see it in the room, but. Niels uh, shared in the chat in Zoom the link. Uh, it's easily, if you go to our website, giganet.org, uh, under membership, there is a link to become a member. So if you apply to be an observer, you can uh, kind of easily become one as a graduate student in the field. Uh, you'll be able to join the, you'll be added to the listserv. You can ask questions, you know, solicit any advice you uh, feel is necessary for your work if you want to become a member again this is still possible it's kind of the same procedure but i'm assuming that as a student you will uh, need a kind of a recommendation letter or like an endorsement from an existing uh, giganet member and then uh, you can become a member and get uh, kind of even more involved in kind of running the network itself so yes by all means do not hesitate to apply Uh, we have other questions. So before we, uh, uh, before he, uh, he asks a question, I just want to add something about uh, the outreach. Uh, as I said, you know, as Dimitri said, I'm the chair of the outreach and the partnership. So uh, yeah, we, we want to have more opportunities, you know, to reach out to community, uh, especially uh, in south, you know, in the south part of the world beyond Europe and the uh, US and uh, those uh, traditional, we have very many members come from that part of the world. So we also want to expand it, our you know, membership from to cover uh, researchers and the students from uh, Asia and from Africa or from South America, all those underrepresented areas. Well, so in, uh, in, in coming years, uh, I think, uh, uh, we will do more on that, and we will also collaborate with different organizations like ICA, IMCR, all these related organizations. So, of course, it's my duty, you know, I should work harder you know, to do more things for our community. So, we will do it, we will do it together as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, hello. My name is Andrew Sherboge. I represent McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Uh, and uh, also I represent, for example, the ICANN Snarello uh, in the, we uh, discussed the academic outreach and engagement there. In the, in the process also I'm involved in the uh, process of virtual schools of internet governance. And I have one question for a theoretical one. And other question will be a bit practical one because I would like to co collaborate, first of all, with the Giganet and uh, like to be uh, fully involved in this academic uh, participation. But the question uh, in the theory is, 
uh, do think that academia should be recognized as a separate stakeholder group within the internet with the scope of the internet governance process thank you as first of all that as a as a you take a uh, privilege as a role of outreach uh, chair of the Kikana. I think so. I agree with you. I mean, entirely we have a such you know large uh, community as academia that when we have a, our own you know uh, ideas and uh, positions and uh, we, I think it's legitimate to raise that questions and uh, also to ask uh, the ideas or whether we should you know uh, you know uh, divide. Uh, as a community and uh, as a one community uh, of the stakeholder in the IG system. Yeah, that's my my comment. So, yeah, so, yeah. Dimitri is, yeah, back to you. Yeah, I wonder if other steering committee members want to chime in. <laughs> Nils, Nadia. Okay, um, that's a good question. Honestly, I think it's been a while since I tried to kind of think uh, about it. And what I'm kind of, maybe let me try and turn this question kind of back at you and ask you what uh, kind of, what are the unique concerns that uh, academics bring to the table that uh, you think are not reflected in other stakeholder groups? Because I would, I would kind of, yeah, uh -huh. I'll just ask you that and then well, we'll kind of uh, have a conversation. Sorry, uh, I would like to answer this question because it's, uh, it's, absolute <laughs> it's absolute concern that I have. For example, I'm a lawyer on my background. Uh, and uh, when I taught in, the, in, the, in Russia, in Moscow Higher School Economics for nine years, it took me seven years to, to, to form a working group, an official working group on internet governance because lawyers are dealing with law, computer scientists are dealing with computer science, and there is absolutely no collaboration between, uh, between them. And uh, what about the specific concerns? Of, of course, every, every single issue of internet governance need explanation from academic point of view from different perspectives from legal uh, let's say uh, sociological political science uh, let's say regional science cultural science everything is interconnected with it so this is the specific set of concerns it's hundreds of concerns maybe thousands uh, we can decide on thank you very much that's my opinion sorry for emotional okay but it is. No, that, that, that's not that I find. I would just say that it seems to me that there are kind of two directions in which you can ask this question. Because like the original question you asked is whether uh, we whether whether you know academia should be like a separate stakeholder within kind of inter internet governance discussion spaces or inter governance you know institutions as a separate stakeholder. Whereas your example is actually facing in the opposite direction, right? It's the idea of, a, it's, it's more of a question of whether internet governance is a discipline. And this has been kind of an ongoing, uh, I guess, debate. Uh, and we, I think there was even a conference recently organized by Milton Mueller, where he was questioning the mere label of internet governance and whether it should be, you know, the political economy of information. And that's the discussion that we, um, I think should have and may want to have within the GigaNet or kind of building on GigaNet network. But I think these are two separate questions about, again, like carving out a label for the academic uh, community within uh, the internet governance space as opposed to carving a space for internet governance within academia. That's what I would say. Thank you. Sure. sure. Other, other comment from the other AC committee member? So, so I, I would like to ask a question, if I may. Yeah. 
especially kind of for both for people who have been participating in in uh, GigaNet and in GigaNet events for a while, uh, as well as people who just discovered GigaNet with this event. Um, how do you kind of, what would be your list of, you know, wishes and aspirations for GigaNet? How can we as a network help you, you know, better do your research or teaching in academia? Whom do you want to uh, pose this question to? Just the people in the room. I do not see the room, right? But okay. uh, uh, I'd like to pose it as a question to the floor. Sorry for being so active. I think that uh, so we can do a lot, uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of useful things. So, so, so uh, we have different examples of the virtual school of internet governance, the different regional schools of internet governance, or just participated in uh, NASIC in Puerto Rico, for example, in the uh, North American School of Internet Governance. Uh, and uh, so there is, a, uh, so I can see that demand uh, from, uh, uh, let, let's say, university students from the university community to uh, learn more about that, to be more deeply involved. For example, in uh, the, with uh, I also uh, teach in the online free courses, let's so call free free Moscow University uh, on internet governance, and we are teaching there. How to participate? How to get involved? Uh, what it is, 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 is the the complex of uh, uh, let, let's say uh, not easy issues, uh, and uh, the the issue you have to guide uh, not, not only students, of course, but also academic community how to be more involved, and I, and I think. Uh, one of the best solutions for that is to organize more, let's say, conferences, maybe uh, uh, not on the side of the Internet Guards for it's good, uh, it's good, uh, a good place to organize this, uh, but also to organize the separate conferences uh, dealing with uh, solely academic issues of Internet Guards. Maybe that would be a good idea. Thank you. Just if I can ask like a small clarification, when you say academic questions of internet governance, what do you mean? Do you mean uh, kind of questions around the substance of what we may include under the umbrella of internet governance or kind of more practical aspects of kind of professional development within the field of internet governance? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, do you want to follow up? Response. I suppose just that, quickly. Uh, academic uh, academic uh, issues of internet governance would be, let's say, uh, for example, explanation of the uh, normative papers may be created in this field. I'm a lawyer for uh, for my background. I can make the command, commented version. For example, I created a commented version of the Charter of Rights and Principles, which created on the auspices of the IGF. So the different signs, uh, different, uh, uh, of, of, of course, uh, uh, and we have also other political scopes, social scopes, and other, other kind of scopes. Uh, all, 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 all of these specialists have a word to say, and th that, that will be academic issues so uh, and uh, without this explanation i don't think th it will be useful to adopt rules in internet governance according to the mandate of internet governance create rules rules of procedure and standards all of these need an academic explanation and that i suppose will be the academic issue with internet governance thank you thank you okay. Dimitri, and uh, we're very lucky. We have uh, two, you know, two delegates from China. You know, they are presenting here. So, because we, it's real. I mean, we we don't have many chance to meet them on site. So yeah, I would like to invite one of the uh, Chinese colleagues to talk about uh, what do they think? Uh, how Giga can 
help to boost uh, you know the IG research in China is that okay sure hi uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to join this event and although I'm not a member of this com community yet but I guess uh, this the gigat can be a platform uh, which can help us to do the inf information sharing especially in the digital economy for the internet governance the internet has the feature of the globalization and it is very significant for us to have the sharing information and to reach a value consensus and to know each other better and to achieve the international cooperation yeah I, I th thank you yeah so i think that's a, a, a colleagues from room you know and the chinese colleagues from room because they are especially interested in how the ig can you know help the uh, researchers and the academics in china especially in terms of digital governance you know what whatever we call it, uh, internet governance or digital governance as well, okay? And uh, so, yeah, we have other question, no? Okay, yeah. So I think it, uh, yeah, you want to see? Hi, uh, thank you very much. I'm Sayed from uh, Iran, uh, a professor at the universities. We are working on internet governance there also. We are very much uh, interested to participate in the, in the, in the, in the GigaNet network, actually, uh, because, of, uh, uh, because of similar issues that we are facing with, uh, particularly uh, regarding the uh, platform governance, transnational platform governance, and the, the, the way that they are uh, dealing with the developing countries and particularly with uh, kind of the political agenda that they are uh, dealing with us uh, uh, regarding the uh, kind of the sanctions and the kind of the censorships that they are, uh, they are, they are doing over those kind of the countries. And uh, this kind of the issues is something that uh, several countries are facing with, how to deal with international transnational platforms and how to uh, how, how to how to come across to a kind of the shared solutions to uh, at the same times to keep their uh, national sovereignty and also to uh, benefit from uh, uh, using those in transnational platforms and the networks uh, the, the, the the global networks that they have they, ha they have covered it's a kind of the dilemmas that uh, uh, several countries like us we are facing with and it's a kind of the governance uh, uh, related issues that we need to think about and we need to discuss within the networks of the uh, governance, uh, internet governance researchers. Uh, I arrived a, a bit late today and I missed uh, most of the, the session but I would like to join the, 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 the network and to raise those kind of the issues with our colleagues uh, across the globe. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just, if I can just quickly respond to like kind of both last comments, because I think they speak to the same issue. Um, membership in GigaNet is an individual membership. So everyone is welcome to kind of imply and join the network. Um, and the discussion in the and the kind of activities that we get in the day again, like so, it's around research. Like we're a global academic network, so um, I guess you know, consulting people around uh, on issues, soliciting partners to organize events, anything that kind of fits into the broad mandate of academia uh, can happen on GigaNet. And again, membership is individual. Uh, so, you know, everyone in this room is welcome to apply. And uh, again, there is a link on the website. If you go to giganet.org, uh, there is a membership tab and under membership, I think there is how to apply, which explains how uh, this works. Um, other questions in the room or online? Um, I think uh, uh, we, they, they all 
already asked the questions from Flo and Ru. Uh, yeah, Flo okay. and Ru in, in the room. Okay. So yeah, so I give the time. I wonder if other steering committee members want to chime in. Any kind of reflection on the symposium? Um, Yeah, Nils, go ahead. I'm actually, I I wonder if I can unmute you. Let me see. I have the power. Here we go. You can speak now, I think. Thank you so thank you so much, Dima, for uh, allowing me the floor. Do you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you well. Excellent. It's a real pleasure to be, uh, uh, to be connected to you all and to speak to you here from uh, Amsterdam. So I really appreciate all the work that has been going into the today and the fruitful discussions and the excellent papers that have been presented. And I think it really shows the health and uh, growth of our community of internet governance researchers, but also as a platform to discuss these new issues of sanctions, of fragmentations, of interconnection. And whereas I don't think we have actual answers, what GigaNet has been doing and I hope will continue to do and for that we need you is to put this issue on the agenda and provide an academic platform to discuss these so that we can have a uh, science be science informed policy decisions that we can also understand whether the policies that are implemented actually have the impact that we expected of them and if not how else they could address uh, uh, issues such as uh, adverse or uh, intentional human rights impacts. So I really hope that the people who are not will consider become a member of uh, GigaNet and that the people who are already a member of GigaNet will consider running for uh, uh, positions in the steering committee because our association is only as strong as its participation, just like the internet itself. Thanks so much. Thank you, Nielsen. For those who do not know, Niels is the vice, the current and continuing vice chair of uh, GigaNet. Yeah, I think that's all from our our side. Uh, yeah, from the uh, from the audience on site. So yeah, I give the time Perfect. back to you, Dimitri. Okay, Nils, uh, did you uh, raise the hand? Shall I unmute you again? Did you want to say something? No, no, no. I oh, okay. Leftover hand. Okay. Uh, well, so if that's the case, I would like again to thank everybody who uh, attended, who stayed for the business meeting, um, encourage anybody who, as Niels did, anybody who is not a member to become a member. And if you are a member, uh, do a stand in the election for the vacant positions. If you have any questions about what it entails, uh, don't uh, hesitate to ask any one uh, of the current committee members. Our names are on the website under the governance tab. Um, and I hope to see you all in other GigaNet events and at the symposium next year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all. Thank you. So we conclude our business meeting and uh, also we conclude our uh, GigaNet symposium today. Okay. We'll see you next year. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.